Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and let Leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness. Explore ideation. Build community and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacore West. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other piece I think is so important to remember is like, how did you and I meet? I mean, we meet because we have similar interests. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that kids with disabilities, let's say you put 20 kids, you know, with who experience Down syndrome in a room or who experience learning disabilities in a room and people unconsciously or consciously, whichever, think that kids like that need to be with kids like them. Exactly. Well, most kids, oh. <laughs> you know, are interested in Pokemon or Legos or mm. Barbies, or I don't, I don't actually know, you know, all of the cu current cultural stuff that kids are interested in sure. and, or, or music and that, and they make relationships and friendships with other kids like them, Right. kids who like soccer or Pokemon or, and that is the best hope we have of people creating relationships is of course spending time together and being together, but most relationships are created either around interests or shared experience. So, yeah. you know, if you meet a soldier who went to boot camp, mm -hmm. they have relationships with the people in the boot camp because mm -hmm. they experience that together. And so for kids, even that are just in the same class together, kindergarten, first, second, third, 10th, 12th, people have relationships just by being in those experiences together. Also, they have relationships by being involved in extracurriculars. Same with you know, the adult world, you know, I met a kid, I met an adult um, who was in a highly segregated environment, but really loved cars. And, you know, we had a lot of discussions around how do we make sure he has relationships that aren't paid, real, meaningful relationships that provide the things that we all need. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you start looking at any interest for cars, there are classic car meetups, there are, you know, chat rooms around cars, there are people that fix cars. There's YouTube communities that do stuff with cars. I mean, I don't even know all the stuff with cars. Right, but there's so much that interest, there. And most interests are like that. You can find some sort of esoteric community for every single interest you could name. And, and, and those things are much more likely to build bridges and create relationships. Mm -hmm. And so those are the opportunities that inclusion has to offer us. And I think the other piece to remember is that inclusion happens in naturally occurring proportion. So for young kids, for not young kids, but you know, K through birth through 21, mm -hmm. the average rate of disability identification is between 10 and 12%. Wow. Now, as life goes on, we all know as you get older, you have a larger chance of experiencing disability, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But so in a classroom, we look for between 10 or 12% of kids that have disabilities. Those would be varying disabilities, right? One kid might use a wheelchair in one classroom, and another kid might have an autism in another classroom, and another kid might have ADHD. And when you think about classrooms like that, I think about teachers that actually could implement support plans because it would happen in a naturally occurring manner. Mm. When you put eight and 10 kids with pretty intense support needs in one classroom, it becomes very difficult for teachers to implement the supports. Additionally, the other thing we say is the idea of natural support. So what might, if I was hanging out with one person with a wheelchair with eight other people and the person needed assistance being fed, mm -hmm. well, we could kind of switch around and occasionally, you know, help somebody access, you know, eat a sandwich, right? Right, absolutely. If it's only me 
if it's me and four people who use wheelchairs and also need assistance being fed, that can be pretty overwhelming. Absolutely. And so kids and adults will step up, right? When we're not overwhelmed. When we're overwhelmed, it, then it really does become, um, it, it really can be challenging. So I really, when we think about inclusion, we also have to think about what does it really look, what, what does that really mean? And oftentimes we call things inclusion that are actually what I would call clustering. That sounds right. That sounds so accurate. It really does. Because that's what it ends up looking like. And I don't even think that people realize what's happening until somebody points it out. They don't because the other thing is we're really tricky with our language. We call things inclusion that aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the other thing is we're not very honest about segregation or exclusion. I would call those things both. So exclusion is when somebody with a disability does go to a faith service, whatever faith, and the leader walks up to them and says, we have a service for people like you on Wednesday night. Oh, goodness. It feels exclusionary, right? Yes. You belong somewhere else. Um, but that leads to segregation, meaning that people are in programs only with other people with disabilities. Right. And so too often we say, do they offer accommodations? Do they offer inclusion? Or do they offer support? What we really mean is, are they exclusionary? Mm, wow. So, so I keep on seeing all these um, things on Facebook all the time. I love Facebook. And it, they're always like, there's a playground being built that is inclusive for kids with physical disabilities, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's got, a, it's got a ramp and it's got a swing. And I always think, God willing, at some point in my life, all the headlines look like some um, ignorant person is actually building a playground that's not inclusive. I hope that becomes a headline one day. That would be right? amazing. That would be amazing. I'm hopeful that we're closer to that now than we've ever been. I hope so. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. So, you know, so basically, you know, we, I think we will come, we'll come to the age we want to be at. We don't offer inclusion. It happens so right. we're, because we're not excluding people, right? Absolutely. So, that's, so I, I hope that's a good, and so, yeah. Integration and inclusion are terms that can oftentimes be used um, kind of interchangeably. I like the term inclusion because I think it paints a much um, a much more vivid picture, but integration can also be like that. Right, right. And, you know, that's why I think I fell in love with the camp that we found because it wasn't even a big deal. It was, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, we love kids. Does he need any medications? No. Okay. Right. right. And if he does, we can accommodate him where you tell us the schedule and we will make that happen. And I saw that with other kids and I thought, this is fantastic. Here, my kid can right. be a kid, just himself. And, and that's what I loved about that. And it's not a fancy place. It's not with all the bells and whistles. Doesn't matter. That before, right? Kids need dirt. They need swings and a playground and each other. Right. You know, and adults. And willingness. Yeah. And willingness. And they do need. I mean, I think just love on them. You know, like for right. Yeah, and that to me. And people need. People need. Yeah, and I I hate the stuff out there that's like the worst disability is a bad attitude, and you know, and like there's no disabilities. There's only like narrow-minded. Like that's all absolute crap and that's not a legal term you know people (laughs) have true they have true disabilities they truly do need adaptive support absolutely and appropriate support Mm -hmm. but I think what we act like when a parent goes to register their kid for a camp and the the camp then says we don't take kids like your kid let's Mm -hmm. be clear that that is a rejection it is exclusion yes that is. it is and it's and it's a harm and parents and kids with disabilities internalize these messages of rejection over and over and over again. And it happens in the disability community. Mm-hmm. If you have, um, if you have an adult um, that you're supporting that has behavioral challenges and you go to certain places to sign them up for services, they'll say, we take people with these types of disabilities and not those. So it even happens in the disability service system that even the very people who are supposed to help you mm-hmm. can also reject you. Yes. Yes. I recall one time I was looking for um, an after-school center for my son, just with 
other kids, you know, where he could be while I was working. And I went to one place um, that I pass by frequently, even now. And the owner, um, it was so interesting to me. Um, the owner turned out to be a New Yorker like I was. And, and we were saying, oh, mm -hmm. okay, because it's, it's, I meet so many New Yorkers down here in Georgia. But I, I brought my son with me um, because he's the Thelma to my Louise. We, we like hanging out <laughs> with each other. You yeah. know, um, as he gets older, not so much him, but I do. <laughs> but, I see it. You know, our interests are different sometimes. But um, when I mentioned to the owner, I said, well, you know, um, my son has autism. And, and I'm saying that not for any other reason than, you know, um, he understands everything you're saying, but you may have to model a couple of things for him. That's all. Right. Wasn't a big deal. But as soon as I said my son has autism, he said, well, how bad is he? And then he saw my face and he caught himself. And what, what broke my heart was that he, my child was there. And, you yeah. know, I just thought I would be honestly angry if it was just me but now I was heartbroken because my child had to hear that and he understands what you're saying to him you know or about him you know and I just thought well okay so many reasons this would not be the right place for us but that that was the only one that I I really am going to focus on right now and so you know and you know I didn't like it because I thought the lighting was too dark there were too many kids all of that but if this is the owner's mindset um right you know, that's not a place for us at all you know and so we found you know something that we loved and it's all good now but I just thought to myself this is this is what kids have to deal with and I felt sad as we walked out because there was um a young child with muscular dystrophy um and they were just hanging out there by themselves in the dark and I thought Right. What this kid's parents think, you know, and this is where it starts. And so I, that's why I love the work that you do as a fierce advocate, because so many of us um, are thrust into that position and, and we pick up the mantle and then we find that we like, you know, being that advocate. It's, 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 it's a lot of work because you're, you're always trying to, you, you're always hyper vigilant. Broaden. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, it's it's made me, I think, um, a better and more empathetic person um, than I would have been otherwise, you know. Um, and it's let me see people from from a different perspective, you know, and not just people with disabilities, but all people. It, so if a person behaves in a certain way, I then ask myself, why are you behaving that way? There has to be a reason for it, you know. And I try to right. to, to just look at it from that perspective, but. Here's my next question, because I can go on for days with you about this. This is, I, I love that we are able to have this discussion and, and really have listeners just partake of it as well. But let me ask you this then. So with regard to cultural competency, what role do you think that plays in disability? I mean, it's huge. And I don't think we talk about it enough. Yeah. But I've rep I worked with families um, who, you know, are from varying countries and um and are either one generation or 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 new or newer immigrants and um and their views on disability you know maybe that disability is a private thing that is only to be you know known by the family so having a school-based meeting or another type of meeting with strangers would be um you know really really highly not forbidden but really um just really distasteful or really countercultural. Yeah, um, and a perfect term, countercultural. Mm -hmm. Right, and so so it's not. And then you can hear people again with the behavior piece saying, "Well, those parents don't care." Well, not at all. Okay. It's, it's you know this is just not how they people approach disability. Some people have a lot of shame in 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 their culture that that people with disabilities mostly stay home yeah. and that they wouldn't be out much, uh, and that that's you know a belief that's been handed down for generations and is really strong and it has to be addressed. I've met people who um, are worried about their immigration status and um, and are afraid to ask for any types of services because the penalty could be deportation. Oh. And I understand that one. Yeah. Um, and um, and places and, other, and also people that come from countries that there are no governmental services. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't even think to 
right, to knock on the door and, and ask or even advocate for services. That seems like such a foreign concept to them because it never existed in the home country. Right, and they're doing, I mean, and then you think about, and you, you would speak to this so much better than me, but all of the battles people are fighting on all of the fronts to, you know, beyond the language piece. I mean, the language piece would be absolutely huge. Yes. Um, and the lack of um, people using interpreters, lack of competent interpreters. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Don't get me started. Um, the lack of competent and professionally trained, I have to, to specify that, interpreters, um, not only in the state of Georgia, um, across the United States, but it is rampant um, in the state of Georgia and there, and particularly South Georgia. Um, I'm actually mm. traveling there um, this weekend um, for trainings, and I, I just remember um, people telling me there are horror stories, farm workers who barely make $200 a month, or I'm sorry, barely make um, $800 a month. They are paying someone to interpret for them um, for mm. $200, you know, for two hours. And most of the farm workers, they send over 90% of their salary back home to their families. So right. they don't make a lot of money. And for someone to do that, um, interpreters are not supposed to be paid if they're interpreting um, for a hospital system. But this person is just going on their own um, with no regulation, um, no training, because if you're properly and professionally trained, you know that you can't do that. It's unethical. Um, so mm. they are just charging these families exorbitant fees. Um, mm. And my heart breaks for them. And so the solution to that was to train um, the community members um, serving as, you know, clinic advocates, well, advocates for them in the clinic um, to become healthcare interpreters. And so um, right. I'm so glad that, that we were able to accomplish that um, because then we had a class of about 15 people and some became nationally certified, which is the equivalent of getting your PhD in interpreting. Wow. And, I mean, it was, you can change a neighborhood, you can change an organization, you can change a neighborhood, you can change a facility, you can change an entire community um, and, and push them towards better health outcomes through education. And that education can be Agreed. in the form of, of interpreters, properly trained, um, credentialed people who abide by code of ethics. And I just think to myself, that language component, I, I'll shout it out from the top of a mountain forever. Um, even though I've, I've been retired from interpreting, I, I believe so much in it because it really has a huge impact. But as you were saying, there are other obstacles on top of that. Even the use of an insurance card, for instance, um, that doesn't exist in many parts of the world. And so, you know, I can't. Absolutely. Imagine. You know, someone walking. And in the I can office. barely understand my insurance, and I'm exactly. really struggling with it. And I am a lawyer exactly. <laughs> who exactly. has a lot of education, and I, I'm only, I only, I'm, you know, one of the, you know, not so smart Americans, but only speak one language. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a huge thing. The other thing I really encountered with cultural competence that I really wasn't prepared for, and it took me a long time to understand, is that. There are many people that don't trust the system for really good reasons. Absolutely. So families that I would that would call me to represent their kid who did not want to meet me in their home because I could go in their home and they've had other well-meaning white women 
um, or or not well-meaning people um, muck in their family or call defects on them or um, or or um, or just cast aspirations on their parenting or um, people who've made promises that don't keep them. Um, you know, and, and, and people, a lot of people um, who've grown up with the legacies we have of, you know, of racism and homophobia and xenophobia and all of these things, I, I understand why people wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily trust other people, even if they've called them. Mm-hmm. But that took me a long time to, to even kind of wrap my head around, like, I, when I was younger, especially a year or two or three, I'd be like, listen, I'm paid for with your federal tax dollars, and, like, I get a thousand calls a year and I help a hundred families a year. Like Mm -hmm. not, you should be grateful, but like, at least you should tell me information and people wouldn't tell me the whole story. And I would be so, I I mean, to be embarrassingly blunt, I was like offended. Right. Like I'm on your side. It took me, it took me a little while to understand like how screwed people had been when they had told people what had happened. Um, So I don't know if that falls directly under cultural competency, but um, but I, I think it does. Yeah, I would say it does. I would say it does on both sides. I would say it does because you learned to be more culturally competent uh, because you took into account at that point, you know, after seeing multiple families, their experience and their cultural lens by which they were viewing you. And then on the other hand, the families became more, more culturally competent as it pertains to people here in the United States trying to help them and knowing about the availability of services and knowing that there, there are no re- repercussions or reprisals because of them receiving those services. So I think that is a huge part of it. I really do. Well, let's see. Right, oh, and I think the understanding that it might, it might, I think what really took me quite some time is understanding that like, this wasn't business like, like they weren't going to sign a release for me to look at the information right. on my timeline. I was going to have to build a relationship with people and it might take longer. Mm-hmm. But that was my job, not a barrier to my job. That was how my mindset changed over time. Oh, I love that, Leslie. I love that. That was your job, but not a barrier to your job. I think that's fantastic. Like that is a huge shift. And, and it's good that, you know, you recognize that, but then that they recognize that because that was all about relationship building. Well, I would also say, have you been burnt? In the, I mean, I also got, got smarter to at least honor people's experiences, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and say, well, you may have been burned by that and yes I have seen that and and also kind of we were talking about earlier around the use of restraint seclusion like honoring that it's not some sort of paranoia but like retaliation happens yes people exactly. I've seen you know these this isn't this isn't some sort of imaginary worry that that people who people just have mm-hmm. but it's, it's people's lived experience and um and it's a worthy worry and you know I think people underestimate the idea that no action is action Mm-hmm. You know, so if somebody decides to talk to a lawyer, an advocate, and not get involved in that, that's also that's their that's their decision. Um, when I was when I was, you know, at different stages of my learning, I I found that to be a wrong decision. But I also know that, but as I stayed in the game longer, the times people call me a year or two or three later, or call you know for a piece of advice at another time, you know, that it took time. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. But I love that it happened, you know, and and that's the thing. It requires a degree of patience. And again, this is why I applaud the work that you do, because it requires a degree of patience that I don't know that that I have. Um, But I also know that, you know, these are how these are how buildings are built, you know, the, the, the building of relationships. This is the foundation of them, you know. So every day I try to tell myself, you know, be patient because it's not a quality that I easily have. Um, but I dare say, um, this is how my son has made me better <laughs> for the world, I think. <laughs> yeah. And and in my current work, um, whereas I represented individual families through a nonprofit for a long time, um, almost a year ago, I hung out my own shingle. And now what I do is I work with people who want to help other people's children in school-based advocacy. Yeah. So working with working with ordinary citizens who who want who believe in educational equity sometimes parents because of disabilities sometimes retired school teachers sometimes lawyers sometimes interpreters whoever mm-hmm. you know who who want to increase their skills on advocating for somebody else's kid because a lot of the things you and I talked about that are so hard in advocating for our own kids right it's a totally different skill set to advocate on behalf of somebody else's kid yes indeed. and there's not a lot of work in America 
around ab- teaching people to advocate for other people's kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that that's professionally where I can have the biggest impact at this point in my career is creating many people, more people thinking about the work the way we are and bringing more people to the work. And, 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 and the whole idea of qualifications and studying and being better at it and keeping current. Um, those, these are things that advocates really don't have the opportunity to access that information. And just like you want, you're making interpreting services more available in South Georgia, I want to make advocacy services more available across America. I love it. That's fantastic. And actually, with my work in South Georgia, um, now that I'm retired, um, what we do now and, and what I specifically go um, doing besides speaking about diversity and inclusion is um, I speak to um, the nursing schools, the medical schools, mm. cultural competence, because I feel like we have to get them before they are out into the world as nurses. Mm-hmm. And because it's so much harder once they're nurses and doctors, they're busy, they're this, they're mm-hmm. that. And of course they're busy during school, but I think school is the ideal place to, to, to create that space where, where they are more open to learning about this particular um, topic. And so um, that's what I'm going to be doing uh, this weekend, just creating that space Exciting. where the nurses and the pharmacy students are going to be able to soak in some of this information about being culturally competent and, and the roles they play and how that can have a positive impact and a negative one, um, you know, in- I in also think that, I also think that students whether they be law students or nursing students or uh, medical students or um, teachers um, in training, like all of these students, mm-hmm. um, I think sometimes they come into cultures that um, are pretty hostile to cultural competency. Yes. And so I think they develop oftentimes bad habits or mm-hmm. wrong mindsets or, or they buy into procedures and practices that discriminate through protocol, if you will. Absolutely. Yes, that is And so super- if we if we can give people the framework before they develop, it's harder to uncreate a habit, oh that's the word, break a habit mm-hmm. than to start off people with a different um mindset. So I, I do think getting people kind of pre professionally is is really a fabulous mechanism for change. Oh, absolutely. It, it's such a wonderful thing. It's such a wonderful thing. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it and to, to just always keep doing it until one day it's not necessary. <laughs> so, you know, I, right. I will do it until I'm no longer needed. But having and the idea that, would be that these things become part and parcel of these professional programs. I think that's somewhere there can be a lot of improvement. Okay, yes. And that's where I think, what, that's the time I think we'll be able to call these programs truly successful is when just like that playground is when we're going to say um, one day, do you believe there wasn't a cultural competence aspect in that training? Like in our men's right. class or in our, right. I mean, or in our teaching Right, program? I agree. Yeah, that's when, that's when I think I will be able to hang up my hat truly and say, okay, the work is done, or at least the hardest part was. <laughs> So then Agreed. we're going to wrap up our podcast now, but I wanted to ask you, Leslie, um, in closing, what are some small steps we can take as a society to promote and actively engage in disability rights, seeking um, equitable treatment of people with disabilities? Such a great question. There's so many things. I'll just pick one that's really timely right now, which would be voting. Uh-huh. I think looking at people's, um, we actually, uh, um, I just got a notice of a forum looking at presidential candidates and their disability civil rights platforms. Mm-hmm. So when you're thinking about the issues that you're voting on, the lovely thing about disability is it crosses all party lines. Yes, it does. Um, we have both um, both political parties have signed major pieces of disability legislation. It's an issue that 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 we could all get behind. And for us as voters to look at and to talk to our elected officials and our our potential elected officials about what's important to us around supporting people with disabilities and us voting. Another piece would be if you are in relationship with people with disabilities, make sure they are voting and they have good supports to vote. Mm-hmm. So I think voting is, 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 is huge, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another piece would be to be in relationship with people with disabilities, to yeah. be personally inclusive, mm-hmm. um, to, uh, to, 
I have, I've actually lately, um, I'm involved in, in my faith community and a lot of and some Jewish programming. Mm -hmm. And, and I've started within the programming sphere as a volunteer saying, so I think we need to make sure we have an interpreter at this event to make sure that I know somebody who's deaf who will want to come to make sure let's build in the accessibility provisions before people come mm -hmm. using a microphone at our events, making wow. sure there are places that are less overwhelming for people that have sensory issues. You know, there are a bunch of different programmatic ways we can make sure that our community events um, and our communities are inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being in relationship, I think the other piece is, and I mean this for all of the well-meaning, lovely parents with kids with disabilities, mm -hmm. let's stop building segregated placements placements and mm -hmm. let's focus on the quality programs that we have making sure that they're inclusive so the idea would be that um that this is a an interesting idea but there are some theme parks that have been built recently in the past 15 or 20 years for people with disabilities well mm -hmm. there are some theme parks like you know six flags and disney world that people with disabilities really do like mm -hmm. let's make sure that those places have inclusive provisions yeah. or that our faith communities are inclusive we don't need to build different ministries or different things mm -hmm. or or even camps people i've seen parents who say my kid's not i can't find an inclusive camp i'm going to start my own camp mm -hmm. um segregated camps usually mm -hmm. let's let's put pressure on places that already have quality programming to build in accessibility provisions and the last thing i would say is let's do it one by one by one by one. Mm. When we group all people with disabilities together, it's much less, it's much more likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. So if I was a camp that had not been inclusive, I would include, I would take one kid that I wasn't sure how well I could support in each grade or stage, mm -hmm. and I'd work it in building quality supports for one kid made successful. Then oh. you want to try two, give people a chance for success, mm -hmm. you know, baby steps. Um, and, and, and building up the people providing those, those support services, build up their competency and, um, and the communication and all of those pieces, and one by one. Like, I think people think I'm a little bit of a radical and I am a little bit of a radical. But, um, but, I, but, I, but these things are not done. You know, we have a huge legacy of segregation and exclusion. And in order to really combat that, we're going to have to be thoughtful, and it's going to take time. Yes, we're okay. going to have to be very... How was that? Was that too many things? No, it's not too many things. I think you've given us a great action list, a great call to action for us to, to tackle, honestly. And, and the thing is, I love what you said about one child at a time, because, you know, what's that saying, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. I, you know, and this is how we must start. And, and I mean, I, I take this to heart personally and professionally because I know that this is how things actually happen. Um, our son, as I said, went to a camp that was just for all kids. And the first day he made a friend, but it was because that camp created a space where they made it just very natural. It wasn't, you have to go say hello to this person or you must do that. You know what I mean? And so I think mm -hmm. we have to be intentional about the spaces that we create. We, we do have to be careful not to, not to revert back to, you know, the, the days before, um, well, the days after Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Um, we mm -hmm. say that equal is inherently unequal, you know. So we have to we have to make sure that everyone gets gets the benefit of being a, a person in the world and enjoying everything that comes with that. So I do think um, one kid at a time, one person at a time, one issue at a time. Voting, though, I think is very timely, and and I hadn't even thought about the issue of voting and disability rights around that, just even when you're going to the polling places. So I love that you mentioned that because, you know, that time is here and, and it's, you know, our big election is in a year from now, but we have local elections, you know, going on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really, really important piece. So on that note, Leslie, I want to tell, I want you to tell people where they can find you. Where can they find you on social media? How can they um, send you information or get questions from you? Um, where can they find Leslie? Excellent. So um, I have an active Facebook page called Lipson Advocacy. My last name is Lipson, L-I-P as in Peter, S-O-N as in Nancy. Um, so just 
look up that on Facebook, and I'm pretty active on there. You can message me on that platform. Also, I'm on LinkedIn, Leslie Lipson. And my email is Lipson, L-I-P-S-O-N, dot advocacy at gmail.com. And you can find me on, on any of those platforms. I'm happy to, you know, point people in the right direction. And I especially welcome opportunities to work with groups of parents and advocates on increasing their advocacy skills or talking with people about how people with disabilities can have um, valued and meaningful roles within their community. It's my favorite work. So thank you. Awesome, awesome. And everyone, as Leslie likes to say, that's her jam. So make sure if you have any questions, you contact her, you contact the show, and we'll be, we'll be more than happy to get you those links that we mentioned. And so, Leslie, thank you so much for being a guest on the Global Fluency Podcast. I've been looking forward to having you on the show for, for such a while. So I'm thrilled that we were able to speak to you today and that our guests were able to hear all of this powerful and wonderful information. And I thank you for being such a champion of people, not only with disabilities, but through your work with them, you are a champion for society. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having this platform for this kind of conversation. It's so important. Oh, Take absolutely. Care. So everyone listening out there, remember, um, the work now starts with you. Now that you've heard our, our show for today, I want you to get out there and talk to people. How are you feeling about it? Send us your comments. Um, let us know what you think. We're always here for you. And remember, keep the conversation going. I'm Bertine Crevacore west It's been a pleasure to be your host for today's episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. So tune in for our next episode. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.